Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Anders Bresel. I'm currently working at Teleno Connection. Uh, currently, I will probably do that for many years. It's a fantastic company. We are doing machine to machine. We were one of the pioneers in this business. So IoT, telematics, and all that. Mm, the main customers are like Volvo cars, all the those that use the app to start your engine in the morning. Uh, that's our SIM cards that connect those cars. Volvo trucks, buses, Scania, very short home alarms, you touch your construction equipment, lots of insurance companies insuring stuff that are on the road, who's uh, lawn movers, and so on. We are the ones that connect those. We um, uh, do that through SIM cards, and we provide global connectivity. So our SIM cards work across the world. Um, I'm not going to talk about our products or offerings. I'm going to talk about how to industrialize your machine learning models. In, when I talk about industrialization, I'm talking about actually what Errol so many times emphasized. How you need to bring the models out to production. So what I'm going to show you today, uh, later on, is, is an, a framework that actually makes that very, very simple. And at Teleno Connection, we, we were a pioneer. We developed uh, one of the world's first m 2 m platforms, but we were a little company, so we sold it to a big company called Ericsson, and they then sold it back to us as a service. And then they sold the same service to all the other operators, like Telia Company, Swiss Telecom, and so on. So over time, being a pioneer, we were the best in the field in terms of knowledge and experience. We can capitalize on that. But over time, that sort of fades out. The competitiveness of being knowledgeable is sort of saturated. All the other competitors will came uh, to the same level. So we started to innovate again, uh, like three, four years ago. Uh, before that, we didn't have an IT department. We didn't have an, um, a dev department. So where do you start? When back then, it was obvious. If you start over, you go to the cloud. And to make it simple, we went for an all AWS, um, all in approach. And we were very happy with that. Uh, have really good collaboration, and, and we see lots of effects coming out. So we do already have our second generation big data real-time platform, uh, and on that is what I'm going to build on today. So. But first, um, run model complexity. Uh, okay, using thresholds is very simple, really uh, uh, classical statistics. It's also powerful. Machine learning is even better, and deep learning is awesome. But there's a model complexity and a value, and of course, a cost and a value, uh, 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 quality, yeah. But if you look at it from another perspective, the deployability goes down when the complexity of the model increases. And through the history, as we touched upon many times this today, and also yesterday, is that most of these advanced models never actually reach production. So the work you do as a data scientist is getting no scale-out effects whatsoever. If it, it was the times when I worked in research, it was fine to learn and build knowledge just using models, but they didn't scale out. It was only those that sit and look at the model or your visualizations or had you in a meeting that can learn anything from it. It didn't scale out. So, the more advanced the model was, the less likelihood it was moved into production. So I'm going to continue with an analog. And if you have data as your groceries, and you have your compute infrastructure as your kitchen, your data scientist is your chef, your model is your recipe, and your applied model, or your prediction, so to say, is your served dish. So let's play with this, and then what data science and deep learning actually is, is your Michelin restaurant, okay. Uh, but the industry wants something like high throughput, and maybe if they are not, uh, good with simple stats, so McDonald's. There's another approach to it. And if we look at um, 
sort of the Michelin restaurant, it doesn't scale. There's a few customers can visit it, it's only a few dishes that can be served all the time, while this one is the industry, industrializing uh, a concept. It, um, so let's look at the attributes we see in these two, two different uh, settings. You have the high quality, the low throughput, it is expensive, long time to establish, and requires highly trained employees for the Michelin concept. But if you move over to McDonald's, the high throughput, well, it is not of high quality, it's not, the, not how they sell it, um, but it's high throughput and it's cheap and quick to set up and establish. And I don't know, maybe McDonald's is a franchise, but anyone can do it, it's very simple. It is a program to establish this and, and scale it up. So. so let's see which of these attributes is what you're really looking for. Well, there's only one on the Michelin side, and the other ones are on the <laughs> McDonald's side. So, what we want to do is take the best of the two worlds and have your Michelin fast food restaurant with high quality, high throughput, cheap, quick to set up and establish. I grayed out the last one. Um, anyone can do it? Might be because I'm a data scientist by heart myself and don't want to marginalize myself, but I think we can utilize the data scientists much more effectively. Um, and if that is uh, the goal, yeah, we can serve more. So, but there may be even data engineers that can do a lot of this work also, so more can do it. So before I move into demo, I will just recap on some fundamental principles around machine learning, collect data, model, train, deploy, and predict. And historically, uh, I mean, I've been in this business for 15, 20 years or something. It's, um, <laughs> we, we had the data offline, we got a batch data set, uh, we worked on my laptop, and we submit our training jobs to Linux cluster. That was maybe fine. Um, but now we know that all the offline data is outdated, is value in it, is, is sort of, well, all the patterns that are really actionable is the most recent patterns, not those we had eventually collected in the CSV file um, back in history. Um, when we work on our local laptops, we install our favorite libraries, do our custom code, um, and we struggle with the limitations of the compute power. So we move over to the Linux cluster, and then what happened then was that, oh, the, all the dependencies, with different architecture, different hardware, and so on, so a lot of stuff that has to be done and set up to actually just train you. But even if you manage to do that, from an organizational perspective, if you had a Linux cluster, it was a fixed cost, and the training was just on, on locationally. Uh, and even if you had a luxury as an organization that you utilized your infrastructure very well, uh, as a data scientist, when you submit your training job, you had to queue, okay? So there were two strategies using few nodes and run the training job for long and get high chance to start early, or require lots of nodes and do your job fast, but wait a long time before you start. So it was not really a good situation either or. Regarding deploy and predict, it wasn't really possible. All those non-IT standardized infrastructure, code and software that we built and used, it wasn't really Either it wasn't technically impossible to implement it in production, or there was policies saying, we will not allow your code, and it's not that I don't trust you, but you need to go through all these processing steps in order to put it in production, because this is my system environment, and I will not allow your stuff in here without proper QA. So what if you were did something that actually reached production, you typically went to simple cutoffs or something like that. That was a history, and how does it, things look like uh, today? So I'm gonna exemplify this through the AWS Amazon SageMaker, which is a machine learning, deep learning framework that is thinking about this, or solves this end to end. Um, so we're gonna look at this from the same conceptual stages. Um, at least at our company, we have our real-time data flow coming in. We aggregate and store everything in our big data warehouse, um, and we have done that for years. So we have our streaming and online data, 
and so can you have. And if you have your online data or your streaming data, you can always adjust and compensate uh, for the latest trends or drift and change in patterns and so on. Uh, so no offline. Um, what SageMaker provides is a notebook service, so a Jupyter notebook, pre-installed with all the different AI machine learning algorithms out there. Um, and you can, I don't know, maybe you can run this locally, I don't know. But if you run it in the cloud, you only pay for what you use. It's like a, you spin it up, wait two minutes, and you have the notebook, and then you can kill it after the day, and it will stay, save the state of it, and, and so on. So. Um, when you train using SageMaker, it actually uses the same environment. It is a containerized, so come again, Errol pointed this out. If you containerize your, your, your workload, you can scale out infinitely. And what SageMaker does is it, you don't need to provision your, uh, your, 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 your containers even. You just say, I'm defining my model, I'm going to train, and I'm going to use this many nodes, and all the infrastructure, everything just scales out. You just pay for the seconds you train, and then it's killed, and you don't pay anymore. You don't need to queue either. So that's good. So, and this important thing here is the same environment as from your lap, your, your notebook to your, to your training environment. And then deploy. The neat thing here is that when you have your model trained on containers, the best model, the model parameters that you will end up with, can just be deployed as a container, and you can submit your uh, predictions, your online data to that container. So with a one-click deploy, or um, you, you call it just deploy on your endpoint or your model, it will provision this container, and you can have it online. So now you have a production model. And if you need to scale this out, I mean, if you throw massive amounts of predictions on this, you just have a load balance and spin up more containers in the back end. And it's completely automated. Uh, and the thing is that this prediction endpoint is, supports a REST API. Or you can use the SDK that wraps the, uh, the REST API, as, as I will show you today. But uh, now, then you can just, from your end system, you can just, uh, your production system, you can just do your REST API call throw the predictions, and get it back. And there will be no extra workload on your production system, because all this is managed in the cloud. And none of this requires management of infrastructure. OK, so you see some syntax at the bottom. I'll go you through that in demo. But in matter of loading the data, define your model, fit the model with your training data, deploy it, and then get your real-time data, throw it at a prediction endpoint to get back to the results. So, to the demo. Um, what I'm having today is time series data. Uh, and as we work with connectivity, there are connectivity performance metrics. I'm not going to tell you specifically which is they are, but I have a few. Um, and then, I'm going to use a random cut forest. So those who are familiar with random forest, it's an ensemble method. But this is a tweak of that to account for daily, weekly, natural variations, and can detect variations that will go both go up and down. Uh, and we're going to use our production system today in the demo. Uh, we're going to retrieve six months of data, aggregated by five minutes. I'm going to split them in train and test. And if you have a time series model like this, unlabeled with anomalies, we don't know where the anomalies are, we're going to use the first time uh, series of the time part, uh, the part of the time series uh, to train, and then we're going to uh, test on another one. And as a final touch, we'll also um, not use aggregates. We will use real-time streaming data. So we connect and fetch the latest data for this five-minute aggregate and throw that at a prediction, point, uh, prediction endpoint to get back the results. Um, so, before I move over to the demo, just a recap on Amazon SageMaker. You have your notebook, all your, pre, uh, your algorithms there. You can also come with your own uh, algorithms or your training frameworks or modeling frameworks like MXNet, Gluon, TensorFlow, all those are supported. Um, but uh, Amazon actually uh, done this, all the standard methods you should expect in an NAEI training environment or building environment. You have those optimized for, for these settings, so they are actually pretty much better than most of the standard ones you get from others. 
then you have the training service, and you have your hosting service for your prediction endpoint. And before I started this uh, presentation, oh my, did I forget about that? So let's, I might have forgot to run the, uh, so we need to do that. Uh, so it will take you some time to run all above, okay. Um, like that, and I'll go back here. So, um, so what will happen now is that I will spun up the book, the notebook. Uh, I will fetch the data and I will train, and it will take me about four minutes uh, about to train the data model, and then to provision the end prediction endpoint will take about two minutes. So that's what was I supposed to do when I had uh, uh, <laughs> prepared this, but I forgot about it. Uh, so we will need to wait a few minutes. Uh, meanwhile, I will go over and start go through the demo. Uh, so you s oh, oh, error. This is like the demo goes. Demo demo. So we'll see if it. It does work. Okay, yeah, oh, here it's already run. Maybe we are all good here. We'll see if I can, if it works down here. Uh, we can try it. No, so we'll run this again. Uh, bear with me. Run all above. We'll see if it works now. Yeah, now it seems to work. I think uh, it should be on here. Yeah, so it stopped at the training. So now it's training. Uh, so now I'll start from the top and walk you through it. So first of all, what we, we do is we load. Uh, we have our UPython notebook here. Load some modules. I'm going to load my credential files so I can connect to my uh, big data warehouse. Um, and I set up a query, and I define a function to connect to the big data warehouse. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, oh, let's do like this. Okay, is it big enough? Should you do you want me to make it bigger? Is that good? Yeah, super. Okay, so. Uh, modules, you have uh, the principles how to take you through the. So, we're going to start with collecting data. Um, we define a function to do that. And what I'm going to do now, we run a, a big data warehouse supporting SQL, but it's a column of database, Redshift. So, we're going to throw in our query and get it back as a data frame. Um, so, that's what a get data frame function is. Uh, I've done that and setting up some buckets for the SageMaker in the S3 environment. And this is how the data looks like when I get the training data, the aggregated data. So it starts on the 19th of April, and you see it's uh, by five minutes, and it ends on 8.40. And that's in teleco industry, we use UTC, universal time code, um, which uh, is like a Greenwich Mean Time or something. Because everything is global, and we can just have local timestamps. So in this case, it's two hours behind. So 8.40 and 8.45 is our last aggregate. So that's like only 10, 10 minutes or something like to go. That's pretty, pretty good. Uh, this is aggregated data. So we aggregate on the incoming flow. So it's not real, real time. But. Uh, this is how the data looks like. Um, now it's six months of data. So we see a number of spikes in there. But let's zoom in to uh, two weeks of data here. So you'll see Monday to Friday is pretty stable and repeatable. Uh, with a high peak in the morning and in the evening. And then on Saturday afternoon, it goes down. And on Sunday, Sunday it's, it's lower. And this is repeats itself. So that's the temporal profile. Let's see, the model is um, it's still training. Um, so I think I have a backup slide that I can show you um, meanwhile. Um, 
how it will work, so we'll save some time. So the upper, this is another KPI we are, or metric we're using, but the upper one is the real metric over time. And what I'm going to do then, I'm gonna, when I train this, I'm going to apply an anomaly score for each five minutes aggregate. Um, and you see the drop in the blue line uh, around here. And it's accurate, it predicts that as an anomaly. But it also finds these peaks that are pretty much obvious that you can use a simple cutoff for. Um, so let's move back. Can you know? Let's, uh, you need to fool this one. Maybe we can. Do like this. Oh, you can see it. Okay. So hopefully it has now. Uh, oh, so now it's trained. Uh, and if we, the training here uh, was done up here. I just took my model where I define it and throw the training data on it. Uh, and it runs a lot of stuff in the background. So this is the underlying um, uh, uh, machine learning framework or deep learning framework. In this case, I only was built by 48 seconds. So that's pretty nice. It's not a massive data set. So. Um, and this will take us about two minutes to deploy. So uh, do you have any timekeepers here? Uh, no. But we are supposed to stop at least at 11, so we have like six minutes left. Um, so I'll walk you through, because, uh, yeah, so I actually have some cache data here, so we can use that. Um, um, so I defined a function here. Um, well, first of all, I will throw this training score here, the training data into my predict and score function. So it will convert it to numerical values from a data frame and throw it at a prediction endpoint and return those and apply the original data frame with the scores of anomaly. So it's just a score, numerical value. So how do you say if it's an anomaly or not? It's, an, it's a continuous scale. So I'm doing then a very simple approach where I take the mean score over the training period and then the standard deviation and then I say, if, let me take a cutoff where they take the mean plus three or two standard deviations, that's my cutoff. Okay, so then I define a function just to throw, take my any data frame, and if it has anomalies uh, labeled in there, it will plot them accordingly. Uh, so when I throw the training data, it will look like this. So this is the same data as the model was trained on. Um, the orange line here is the anomaly score. You'll, the blue line is, you can't see, because it's behind. And the black dots are the anomalies reaching the cutoff. So then, um, what I didn't, what I destroyed here before was actually when I run the test data, but I have a cached visualization of that looking like this. So pretty much the, the dashed line here is the cutoff. Um, so we'll see if it's deployed uh, up here again. Um, still working. So I can't throw any data on it right now. Um, I think it will still make an error. Yes. Supposedly. Um, oh, here, here I actually had a. I'm thinking I'm using the wrong one. Here. And this one is still. Okay, but anyhow, uh, it would have been cool to not struggle up the demo and actually show you uh, the real time data prediction. So, uh, what, I, what I was supposed to show you is that. There's, in a half an hour, given that you are not doing a lot of design work on your model, you can actually go directly out to a productionized model. And it's using SageMaker uh, uh, methodology or the service. The neat thing is that you don't need to set up your environment. It will have the same environment as you build your model, you train, and you deploy. Uh, so that solves a lot of uh, issues. So in interest of time, I will wrap up by uh, go move over to uh, PowerPoint. Um, so in summary, SageMaker combines the notebook and uh, the containerized training and also the containerized deployment. 
And you don't need to know about containers as a data scientist for doing this. It's so simple. Um, so I really like And if you just are uh, okay with all those classical classifications, regressions, time series forecasting, and like AI speech, image text recognition, translation between different languages, anomaly detection or clustering like KN, uh, K, KNN or uh, something like that. All those are pre-built pre in, uh, but if you come with your own model or your own framework, your favorite framework, you can actually, there are methods to containerize this and then just deploy and use the Amazon SageMaker framework. And the cool thing is you just pay as you use. You don't need, I heard a question Errol, uh, comment Errol said, yeah, I had a, a customer that said, yeah, yeah, the data science, we want a cluster of GPUs. Yeah, but what do you need it for? Yeah, so we can do awesome stuff. Yeah, but do you have any use case? No. <laughs> uh, but this enables you to use and start modeling without asking for infrastructure first, and that I think is a really key use being in the cloud. Okay, so I got the sign from the organizer. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a joy to talk to you. Uh, hope to see you out there. Thank you very much.